the order papers a motion on tax credits. The Business Committee has agreed to lay up to one hour, 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. The proposer will have 10 minutes to propose the amendment and 5 minutes to wind. Order. All other speakers will have 5 minutes. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly notes the reliance of thousands of low- and middle-earning families on the tax credit system to top up their earnings, deplores the recent attack by the British Government on the tax credit system, which will reduce further the income of thousands of working families and drive them into greater poverty, as well as making it more difficult for people to move into employment. Further notes the proposed introduction of an increased minimum wage by the British Government, but recognises the study by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which shows that the impact of cuts to the tax credit system is much greater than the increase proposed to the minimum wage, which falls significantly short of the wage required for someone to have a decent standard of living. Thank you. And I call Mr Phil Flanagan to move the motion. Many families here are reliant on the tax credit system to top up their earnings. Some of those people are dependent on tax credits as a result of being in low paid employment, whereas others need it because they cannot get enough hours to make enough money to bring them out of poverty. The current tax credit system, while it is not perfect, is a good system as it provides a safety net for many workers who may well be earning the minimum wage but who are underpaid or underemployed, uh, to such an extent that they require additional financial support from the government to have a decent standard of living. For many employees living in large, working in large companies, the tax credit system amounts to corporate welfare, whereby instead of employers paying their staff a decent living wage, the taxpayer has to step in and pay the difference. This is unfair both on, employers, on employees and on taxpayers. Companies earning hundreds of millions of pounds in profit every single year should be paying their staff enough so that they are above the current threshold for tax credits. Employees in such profitable companies should not be living in poverty. Tax credits can also be paid, paid to unemployed people with children. And despite the success of the tax credit system in raising living standards and helping to prevent and take children out of poverty, which is currently scandalously too high, the British Government intent on imposing further unfair austerity measures are changing how this system works. The recent budget announced by George Osborne will lower the threshold at which payments start to reduce to families. Current tax credit payments start to reduce are what they call taper once a family income reaches £6,420. From April 2016, the threshold at which payments start to reduce will be £3,850. There are currently 109,000 claimants in this part of Ireland who are earning above the £6,420 threshold and have a tapered tax credit award. Once the threshold is reduced to £3,850, these claimants will have their tax credit award reduced further. An additional 12,000 claimants will also become subject to the taper once the threshold is reduced to £3,850. And this information has been published in a report produced by the Social Security Agency last month. And in total, it revealed that by the year 2019-2020, £105 million a year will be removed from the pockets of the least well-off through these changes to the tax credit system. Not only will this have a devastating knock-on impact for those directly affected 120,000 families who will lose out by, on average, £918 per year, but it will also result in further constraints to the domestic economy. Every single economic publication that I have ever studied on the matter clearly shows that those with the least, of mount, the least amount of money spend what they have usually in the local economy, which supports and sustains local employment and returns money in a cyclical fashion around the local economy. And this is in direct contrast to what happens to money given to already wealthy people. As those people already have enough to meet their needs, they tend to either save that money or invest it, or they hire a top-class accountant to make sure they don't pay tax on it, or they buy luxurious items which are neither produced nor sold locally. Either way, that additional money brings little by the way of economic stimulus for the local community. The proposed cuts to the tax credit system can in no way be claimed to be tackling uh, people that the Tories and their cheerleaders wrongly describe as being work shy. Those affected by these cuts are by and large working people, but people who are underpaid or underemployed, but people in employment nonetheless. They are people that deserve the support of a government instead of being pushed deeper into poverty and destitution. Some 
usually to the right of the political spectrum, will claim that the increase to the living wage will counter the cuts to the tax credit system. But they are wrong. I support the introduction of a proper living wage to all, to all employees. I believe that working people should be paid a rate that enables them to sustain a decent, decent standard of living. I don't think that a government should have to step in to top up the earnings of somebody in full-time employment. But too many employers avoid that responsibility, and now the Tory-led government in England is shirking its responsibility to protect people in poverty once more. Statistics revealed yesterday by the Office for National Statistics in London reveal that a much greater proportion of workers here are paid below the living wage than in any part of Britain. That is the actual living wage, by the way, and not the new rate falsely promoted uh, by neoliberals and the Tories, which is actually just an increased minimum, but still a poverty wage. These statistics from the ONS show that we cannot be lumped into the simple considerations of an economic policy designed to meet the needs of a small section of the population in the south and the southeast of England. Tory millionaires and billionaires sitting around a cabinet table haven't a clue about the realities of everyday life for working families and for low and middle earners. They think, or maybe they don't care, eh, that everyone was born with a silver spoon in their mouths. That's not the case. Even though the people sitting around that table have considerable assets and considerable wealth, eh, not everybody else in society has. Almost 40% of jobs in places like the North Coast, Fermanagh and Oma, and Middles or District Councils are paid below the living wage. And this compares with parts of London where 5.2% of jobs are paid below the living wage. So, uh, proportionately, eight times as many people in some of our district council areas are paid below the living wage uh, per employee than they are in London. Statistics generated by the ASDA income tracker reveal that the average discretionary incomes in London are now £254 a week, whereas here the figure is not even half of that, at a mere £95 a week. The Households Below Average Income report, published by the Department for Social Development last month, show that 21% of individuals, or 376,000 people, were in relative poverty. Countless families depend on the small amount of income they get through the tax credit system to merely keep their heads above water. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has carried out an extensive piece of work into the impact of the cuts to the tax credit system and the, increase, and the, the, the countering increase to the minimum wage, by the way, which only benefits people that are over 25 uh, and is a, a measly 50 pence an hour. The, the findings of the IFS paint a very bleak picture indeed. The IFS found that amongst households with someone in paid employment, those elig eligible for benefits and tax credits are estimated to lose an average of £750 a year as a result of the changes to the tax and credit benefit system, and yet they will only gain an average £200 per year through the increase to the minimum wage. On average, those affected by these changes will only be compensated by 26% of the total amount they lost through their cuts to the tax credit system through the increase to the minimum wage and they will be worse off on average by some £550 a year. For me, that's not a glowing commendation of the policies being pursued by the Tory party in England, which unfortunately we are subject to here. Now, there's been an ongoing debate here about um, welfare cuts and proposed changes to the welfare system. It's important that we, as an Assembly, stand up and send a very clear message um, that we're opposed to these measures, that they'll have a deeply negative impact on the people that we represent, um, maybe there are some people here who want to make an intervention. I'm not sure, but, but I can see Gregory's lips moving, uh, but I don't see him rising in his place to, to get up and down. But maybe the DUP are going to contribute to this debate. Um, it would be certainly a welcome thing to see uh, members from all parties uh, rising in their place to contribute to this debate, to send a very clear message to David Cameron and George Osborne um, that we don't accept their um, political ideology that cutting money that's going to the most vulnerable people in our societies, people that are working hard, that are living in poverty, they're trying their best, uh, need a hand up. They don't need a foot in their head to keep them down. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the type of policies um, that are being forced on us. Uh, we need to adopt a different approach where we actually invest money to bring people out of poverty. Um, there is an alternative to the proposals uh, that are in front of us. Um, we need to see people being paid a proper living wage. I think if we give more and more of our people a living wage, uh, that would seriously help to tackle poverty, which is a serious problem um, in our society. Uh, the, the proposed cuts to the tax credit system uh, are a regressive step. Uh, they will take us back a generation in terms of the number of families and children, children living in poverty. Um, I welcome the amendment by the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, I do not have um, any great opposition to it. I am prepared to listen to what they have to say. I do not think the House should uh, divide on this matter. I um, would encourage people to, to support the, the motion um, and, if they want, the amendment. And I commend the motion to the House. 
Order. Thank you. I call Mr. Roy Begg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to formally move the amendment in the name of myself and my colleague, uh, Leslie Cree. So, so why did I think an amendment was needed in this motion uh, about tax credits uh, that was in front of us? I have to say, when I read the motion, I was quite shocked. I really was quite shocked. The motion first section notes, then it deplores, and then it further notes. I don't think that's the responsibility of an assembly to note and deplore and note. The Sinn Féin motion does not seem to be engaging in trying to change the proposals, just, just whinging, moaning, complaining from a distance, a bit like what they do in terms of their Westminster seats uh, and their boycott. Um, but this note and deplore motion uh, does raise valid concerns, but it's not focused on seeking the Chancellor to change the proposals to alleviate the problems, and hence uh, I have placed the amendment. It does seem to be, me to be rather pointless to the motion, the first section, noting the reliance of many families on tax credits, a middle section deploring the changes which will adversely affect the low-paid working families, and the final section further noting that the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which highlighted that the increase in the minimum wage will not fully compensate for the reduction of tax credits. There must be more, more that this assembly does rather than noting, deploring and further noting. There was no call for action within the motion. Otto van Bismarck is attributed with having said, politics is the art of the possible, the attainable, the art of the next best. We must seek change through striving for achievable goals. And I must say, I, I see in this motion some echoes of the Sinn Féin policy uh, in terms of their opposition to welfare reform to date. Sinn Féin opposed welfare, and of course there are relations between credit, uh, the, the tax credit bill and, and, and welfare reform in terms of how it will impact some of those less well off in our society. Sinn Féin opposed the welfare, the welfare reform bill at Stormont earlier this year even with the mitigation proposals emanating from Stormont House. To date, they have failed to present achievable objectives. As such, they are grandstanding, and vulnerable citizens are at risk of the full implications of the unmitigated GB Welfare Reform Bill, without any protections, without any additional support. Where is the art of the possible, the attainable, the art of the next best? For too many, Northern Ireland is a low-wage economy. That means that tax credits are even more important here than other regions. And uh, as has been said by the mover of the motions, that has been uh, recognised in terms of statistics. We shouldn't be surprised about it. Indeed, the impact of the Summer Budget 2015 paper by NISRA, uh, the Social Security Agency and DSD, highlights the scale of uh, changes that are afoot in Northern Ireland. 109,000 households earning above the uh, £6,420 threshold for tapered or reduced tax credits, and some 20, 121,000 households in Northern Ireland uh, uh, will be in receipt of tax credits will exceed the £3,850 threshold. And it has been estimated for them that this will uh, result in an average reduction due to tax credit changes of £17.60 per week or £118 per year. But that may be much more severe in, in individual families and individual sections of, of that group. The Prime Minister told the BBC One Andrew Marr show, we are moving to an economy where you get paid more, where you pay less tax, and rather than paying more in tax and getting money back in tax credit, that is a better system, he said. He insisted that a family with someone earning the minimum wage would be better off overall as a result of the changes made by the government to tax thresholds, benefits, tax credits and the minimum wage. In the amendment that has, is in front of you, uh, we have largely retained the original motion, but for completeness we have added the issue of increased tax thresholds. Now, I, I, I have added it. Uh, uh, because that is part of the Prime Minister's argument of, of the, the changes, the cumulative changes to the tax thresholds. But I'm adding it uh, for completeness and ultimately to use it against them because I think even when it is added, uh, I and my colleagues have concerns that, that when you take 
the cumulative changes to the national living wage, the th increased tax thresholds and the reduction of tax credits, many working households will be worse off. Such a situation should not be allowed to occur. P potentially many households on lower wages will be even worse off. Many of these families will have no cushions uh, to fall back on. How will they survive with such uh, reductions? We must, as a society, ensure that work must pay. And it must pay right from April 2016, not at some future date uh, when uh, the national living wage reaches a certain threshold. Uh, those uh, uh, in receipt of tax credits uh, should not be worse off as a result of these changes. And certainly we will be uh, working, uh, lobbying to try and engage so that that is recognised and that further changes uh, are, are put in place uh, before uh, we reach the critical date of April 2016 when these changes are due to take effect. I have noted that some very influential MPs have appreciated the dangers and what is being uh, proposed. David Willits, the former uh, skills minister uh, in the Conservative government, uh, who was recently elevated to the House of Lords, is reported to have stating that changes to tax credits in the budget means the welfare system is no longer making work pay. What, what a damning statement from a very senior Conservative uh, uh, grandee. The Labour MP Frank Field, chair of the Works and Pension Committee at Westminster, and a recognised expert on welfare, has suggested to the Prime Minister to adjust the threshold and the taper to protect those who would be adversely affected by the tax credit and the other cumulative changes. And he has suggested that this actually can be achieved without uh, significant more monies being, being uh, required. More information will be required on that one. Boris Johnson, uh, Conservative MP, former Mayor of, of uh, London, and rival of George Osborne, who made the proposals, uh, rival in terms of potentially a future leader of the Conservative Party, he has indicated his concerns at the cumulative effects of the changes, which will adversely affect many households. I note also that the Conservative uh, leader in Scotland, Ruth Davison, has rightly stated that more information is required, because I think even there, there are concerns. Another budget statement is due from the Chancellor later this year. So there is still an opportunity for refinement and for changes to tax credit and other regulations. And changes could help protect the low pay who may be adversely affected by these cumulative changes. I, for one, would urge, urge you, members of this assembly, to support my amendment so that we don't just note, deplore and further note, but we would go on and urge the Chancellor of the Exchequer to ensure working households Reliant on tax credits are not worse off as a result of the introduction of the government tax changes, tax credits, and the many other changes to the tax system. But they will not be worse off as a result of the cumulative effect that this will have on their lives. Thank you. And I call Mr. Dominic Brad. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I do welcome the opportunity to speak on the motion and the amendment, and uh, we're quite happy to uh, support the motion as uh, amended. Um, I, I wish to highlight the, the wide-reaching and the devastating impact uh, that the proposed reduction of tax credits will have on low- and middle-earning families here uh, and to our economic growth in general. As it currently stands, over 120,000 households are in receipt of tax credits and in many cases they are vital uh, in topping up earnings and ensuring that people can make ends meet. The current proposals seek to reduce the tax credit uh, income threshold from £6,420 per annum to £3,850 from April of next year. Uh, this new threshold is a significant reduction, being nearly half of the previous threshold. So, in very real terms, Mr. Speaker, the new threshold will result in an income cut of £17.60 a week, resulting in a loss of over £900 
per year. Uh, and in my opinion, um, this uh, accurately reflects what a vital source of income tax credits are to families here in Northern Ireland who rely on it uh, in their daily lives. A particular concern, Mr. Speaker, is the effect uh, the new tax credit changes will have on Northern Ireland's children. Uh, and as members have noted, the current family element of child tax credit is worth £10.50 per week, and its loss will amount to £545 per annum. This, is, uh, in, this in combination with uh, the reductions mentioned uh, above, is a substantial loss to families who depend on tax credits to function. This reduction is all the more horrifying when, when we consider that 101,000 children are already in poverty, and this has resulted in nearly a quarter of Northern Ireland's children living in poverty. The British government justification for these changes uh, seems to solely rely on the fact that they have introduced an increased minimum wage, or as they would call it, the national living wage. Since this announcement, the SDLP has been highly sceptical uh, of the Tories' commandeering of this term. We recognised early on that while any increase in the minimum wage is to be welcomed, it is wrong to claim such as the national living wage, uh, as we know it, and it is wrong to claim it, claim it will offset pressures being created through reductions in the tax policy. Uh, the dangers were recognised by the Institute of Fiscal Studies in their analysis of the new policy, which noted a serious reduction in household incomes. The Institute noted that, on average, the new so-called national living wage will only compensate 26 per cent of the losses households with someone in work will face, uh, and they will be £550 worse off per year. This is in contrast to those currently living without the national living wage who face losses of £750. Despite the seeming benefit, the gap will close as time moves on, as the Institute noted. The national living wage offers such little compensation because the boost to gross wages is smaller uh, than the announced fiscal tightening, and that even at this, uh, sorry, and even at this, the national living wage will not benefit the households being most damaged by tax reductions. The SDLP believes that the institute made a clear case for the positive outcomes that in-work benefit have brought to workers. And in face of the British Government national living wage, we have called for a robust discussion on the proper implementation of a true living wage, and we hope to discuss it uh, within this chamber in the future. A true living wage must recognise the cost of living and not what the market can bear. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for allowing me to contribute today, and as I said, we support the motion as amended. Thank you. And I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, and uh, I rise uh, to support the motion as amended by the Ulster Unionist Party, although I suppose we should be glad that they have now clearly broken their links with the party that is actually introducing this legislation in Westminster. The issue is one which genuinely affects my constituents and constituents around this chamber. Uh, and many of them come to me expressing grave concern uh, about the change in the tax credit system. It provides a considerable amount of financial support to many of the poorest people in our society, often subsidising, as many people do not realise, employers and wages that are far too low to live on, helping to top up incomes to a livable level. Tax credit system, therefore, is a vital part of maintaining a decent standard of living for people. However, there are a number of issues uh, with, uh, with maintaining a large tax credit system. Firstly, tax credits are inefficient. 
Awfully simply returning the tax that has already been deducted from previous pay slips with the assistance of a large uh, system of bureaucracy. Secondly, tax credits seek to treat rather than cure a central issue, that is poverty wages. Indeed, tax credits can and do subsidise some of the biggest names on the high street. These are often the names that aggressively avoid tax. In these establishments, a full-time worker or even one on zero-hours contracts uh, working all the hours that they can, but they can still not afford a decent standard of living. Nonetheless, uh, Mr. Speaker, tax credits um, do play an important role for part-time workers. And tax credits are a vital lifeline to alleviate poverty for workers and children alike. It is for that reason that I utterly deplore the way in which the Conservative Government is going about cutting tax credits in a cruel, uncaring and indeed, may I suggest, a deliberate manner. Again and again the Tories wheel out the same explanation, how they basically are pulling the carpet from under the poorest working families in our country. Apparently the shiny new national living wage, which of course we all know is just a rebrand of the minimum wage, is to make up for losses from tax credit cuts. This while they happily turn a blind eye to their tax dodging multinational friends. However, although I welcome an increase in the minimum wage, though I do reject the cynical attempts of the Tories to trick us into thinking that this is some form of living wage. Furthermore, research from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, as others have said, is simply arithmetically impossible for the increase in the minimum wage to compensate for the loss in tax credits, when the gross increase in employment income from the higher minimum wage is about £4 billion, but welfare spending as a whole is due to fall by £12 billion. This means an average loss of £200 a year, but for some upwards of £1,000. Uh, to further insult the intelligence of the electorate last week, the Prime Minister, Mr Cameron, vowed an all-out assault on poverty. This despite the fact that his tax credit changes are due to abandon an estimated additional 200,000 children into poverty by 2020. Indeed, if there is anything that we have learned uh, since the Tory party secured the majority in May, in May, it is simply this, that compassionate conservatism is truly dead. The Tories are an, are an undisputed, nasty party of British politics, completely out of touch with real life. How can a cabinet of millionaires who have never known or wanted financial troubles ever claim legitimacy in understanding the problems that face my constituents, the ordinary people of Northern Ireland? Nonetheless, we can make a difference in the lives of those who struggle to earn a decent income and wage in Northern Ireland. We do that by growing our economy, by fixing our health care system and implementing the welfare mitigation measures that have already been secured. If anyone thinks that the Tories are going to cave in on welfare, they are clearly misguided. Tax credits, however, is an issue in which they are weak. The basis on which they have been concocted is weak. The constituents of Tory MPs, I understand, are already voicing their misgivings on this clearly ideologically driven and charged policy. Maybe if all of our Northern Ireland MPs turned up to vote, we could put further pressure on the government. We know Sinn Féin don't bother to put their pressure on the government by voting. But where were the missing SDLP and UUP MPs when the vote on the welfare of their constituents? Was it not that important to them? This House was capable of filling its benches by two parties to vote for money for special advisers. I don't see too many people here when it comes to dealing with the real people that we all represent, our constituents. I call Mr. Loris Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Dixon was doing very well until the last couple of points, I think. Uh, because he seems to forget that he, his uh, sister party, the Liberal Democrats, was part of the coalition Tory-led government that introduced many of the initial uh, cuts uh, to people's benefits. And uh, maybe that's a part of their history that they would uh, rather uh, forget. But he is right in pointing out uh, the absence on the benches opposite, uh, who milled in in their numbers to ensure uh, that uh, the monies for the special advisers was retained. And 
And it is interesting that there wasn't too many of them holding their noses, going through the lobby, voting for Sinn Féin. I think the only stench at that time was the stench of money when they went through those lobbies in terms of their party interests, uh, Mr Speaker. <laughs> but, Mr Speaker, it is un unfortunately uh, uh, the sad fact that in my constituency, and I would suggest in all of our constituencies, that it's the families with children uh, whose households will be hit hardest uh, by the tax uh, credit reductions. Uh, I think in today's excellent uh, newspaper article of the Irish News, uh, there is an article about uh, Facebook, and I think Mr Dixon also referred uh, to uh, the corporation tax loopholes that prevail amongst many of the Tory-led uh, Cabinet's uh, friends, where I think it's, it's stated that Facebook has to pay in around £5,000 uh, of a tax bill full stop of corporation tax, which is less than an average worker would pay who was on a salary of £26,000. Surely, Mr Speaker, there's something inherently wrong about that. And Mr Dixon is right to point out, I think there's a slow burner of a Tory backbench uh, rebellion. I, I don't think uh, people will be able to sustain and face many of their constituencies, but constituents, particularly in the north of England, who, where families will be hit harder uh, and quicker than, than many others in the south of England. So therefore, it is right to point out that people should be there in, in their numbers to vote down these odious uh, Tory plans. Because what we're seeing across uh, the water is where uh, Mr Cameron has said, of course, that he's not going to stand again as uh, Prime Minister. And we're seeing the wannabes lining up uh, to take his place. And of course, they're all trying to move further and further to the right. And you said the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the war that they're putting against people uh, who are deemed to be on benefits, but they're not actually putting any war on their employers. I mean, this is hitting working families hardest. It is not people who don't want to work. It is people who are in work. And it's quite often the amount of money uh, and tax credits goes towards uh, the payment of childcare. And it is lamentable here, Mr Speaker, that in this assembly, th this executive has been taken to court and found guilty by the Committee on the Administration for Justice in terms of its anti-poverty strategy. That is a damning indictment on this executive. So let's not hear the wailing cries about what others should or should not be doing. We should also be wanting to find out more and holding uh, to account the executive parties, in particular the two big parties who have a responsibility for the anti-poverty strategy in terms of what they're doing to uh, allay some of the worst excesses of the Tory uh, plan here uh, for people who are finding life very, very tough. And I'm sure we all know people, not just uh, uh, constituents, I'm sure we have people in our own families who, want, who are weighing up uh, whether it's worth their while to take a job or whether they need to stay in benefit. And quite often, Mr Speaker, we all know the individual benefits uh, that working gives to a person's self-esteem and to uh, their role in life and in providing role models uh, for their children. But when a person decides whether or not to take a particular job, they have to weigh up the, the financial uh, pros and cons of taking that job and how uh, their families might suffer as a consequence of them having employment. So people are very often having to make very real and tough decisions. So therefore, Mr Speaker, our party is very help, uh, very well uh, uh, behind uh, this uh, motion in terms of uh, not only highlighting the discrepancies and the failed ideology of uh, the Tories, but also in accepting it's not enough to wail and cry and that we will be looking for uh, and supporting any cuts in the loopholes in Westminster in terms of the friends of the Tory cabinet. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. I must say, I think I join with others in saying that I'm surprised at how empty the chamber is for what I think is a really important debate. Um, in fact, uh, Speaker, I've always been a little surprised that the whole issue of tax credits, uh, when it was announced, didn't achieve more prominence 
Um, even in comparison with issues such as welfare reform, which of course have dominated um, uh, political discussion and uh, the popular press, uh, to my mind, tax credits have a much uh, deeper impact on our society and what we're trying to do, because they affect people that are actually in work, that are trying to uh, uh, make something of their lives. So um, it is useful that the debate has been brought forward. I hope it is being addressed in other areas, uh, because you know, if you take such an amount of money out of our economy, you are going to have not only hardship, but I suspect you run the risk of uh, civil unrest. And I don't say that lightly. Um, I don't say that lightly, actually, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, I listened um, to uh, David McWilliams, a uh, famed economist in the South, who is famous, famous for predicting the crash, actually. And he was talking, and I, and I have a great deal of sympathy with this, that the whole balance of what an economy is trying to do is you want to have some incentive that people will work harder, and if they work harder, they get more money, and you know, that is a positive thing. So I'm not totally socialist to my outlook on that. I do want to reward people that do work for a living. But I also have to say that if the gap between those that have and those that don't have increases exponentially, as it appears to be doing now, then ultimately you will have an unstable place. You will not be able to sustain it. And the issue that's been made by a number of other contributors is that the Tories do appear to think that everything is equal across the land. What works in London does not work in the Midlands and most certainly does not work in Northern Ireland. And uh, I wasn't at the Tory conference, I've never, um, I don't think, been to one, but, but I did hear from people coming back that the Tories are actually very pleased with the way that the economy is going. They point at the figures and say, listen, our issues, our policies have worked look at the way things are going, and they will point here. I will give way. To, to Mr Speaker, for giving way. But to the economy here, is it not a fact that uh, wages, real wages, have dropped by some 9% uh, uh, in Northern Ireland over the last number of years? That, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to Mrs Kelly for that point. Actually, the, the, the key bit, um, perhaps Mrs Kelly is aware of this, that there are members of this assembly, ministers, that keep telling us that the economy is going really well here. And yet, in this very helpful uh, briefing from the Department of Social Development, they, they, they look at the medium household income in Northern Ireland was increasing from 2002-2003 until 2008-2009, but since then has been in decline. In fact, the medium income levels in Northern Ireland 2013-2014 is lower than at 2002-03. So we've gone right the way back. And this is an area, whenever people tell us that things are getting better, when they patently aren't getting better, I think we have a problem. So the issue that I uh, stayed on to talk about in this debate, uh, despite the, the absence of numbers, is to say this is a very real and pressing issue. And I'm not sure how this assembly, given the sums of money concern, is able to address it. But, Mr Speaker, if we do not address it, the people of Northern Ireland will look at government in general, that includes us, and say, you are not making my life any better, you are making it worse. And so the big issue that uh, I think we have to find a way of addressing is how do we put this on the negotiating table? And I'm not sure, actually, maybe those people that are involved in the talks are able to say about whether this fe uh, features or not. But for all of the people that talk about welfare reform, welfare reform is only part of the issue. Tax credits are fundamental. And I think it is <laughs> insidious when you try and convince people that they should go out and get work. What the member is saying specifically in relation to the talks that are going on, because the reality is that the tax credits will pile on top of the misery of welfare reform. But actually, in Northern Ireland, we have substantially mitigated welfare reform, and therefore it is important that we actually deliver the welfare reform package that was agreed at Stormont House and Stormont Castle, because if we don't do that, we will have, an, have even more misery once the tax credits hit us as well. In the last uh 
30 seconds uh, to finish, uh, Mr. Speaker. I will just uh, agree with Mr. Dixon there on that. But his, his intervention highlights the thing that I find most strange. The amount of mitigation that we have for welfare reform, the amount of effort we put into that, which I personally think we do have to take, is in stark contrast to tax credits, which we appear to have ignored in its entirety and is just as detrimental to the people of Northern Ireland. So whoever is doing the negotiations, you need to address this issue. I call Mr Leslie Cree to wind on the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and very quickly because I realise I don't have much time. Um, the Chancellor, in his summer budget on the 8th of July this year, announced a range of measures uh, to achieve the 12 billion per annum reduction in the UK level benefit spending by 2019-2020. Included in the measures was a package of reforms to tax credits, including reducing entitlements for many households. Tax credits are reserve matters and changes could be introduced in Northern Ireland without the approval of the Assembly. Tax credits are calculated on the basis of hours and gross income. A household needs to work a set number of hours in order to qualify for working tax credit and then their gross household income is used to calculate how much tax credit a household is entitled to. We are told that approximately 20% of our population is living in relative poverty and therefore a reduction in tax credit will have a significant impact on their lives. Indeed, several speakers have touched on that. The Chancellor said that the introduction of the new national living wage and the raising of the income tax threshold will offset the loss of tax credits. But there is little clarity in how the phasing of the changes will work out. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has advised in the recent assessment that whilst there may be strong arguments for introducing the new living wage, it should not be considered a direct substitute for benefits and tax credits aimed at lower income households. A higher living wage will certainly help those in employment, although there is some doubt about whether it will increase the UK's GDP. I believe that the reduction of tax credits could increase hardship and undermine the importance of making work pay. And speaker, I just may turn to some of the comments we have heard here this evening. First of all, Mr Flanagan, uh, in bringing forward the motion, referred to 105 million reductions by 2019, an average of £918 per annum for each family. He supports the living wage, but there should be no tax credits. Eight times more are below the living wage in Northern Ireland than in London, and he welcomed uh, the Ulster Unionist Amendment. Uh, Mr Roy Beggs, uh, and sort of moving the motion, referred to the, the amendments of the motion, the Sinn Féin motion, uh, which really only whinged and noted various things. No action was called for. And he quoted the Prime Minister, better pay, less tax, vision, the higher tax threshold, and the Tory peer uh, no longer making work pay. He was concerned about that, and indeed several uh, backbenchers maybe are of the same mind. Our amendment calls for action and will not uh, and those will not, the people will not be less off in the meantime. Can't read my own writing. Uh, Mr. Bradley supported the motion and amendment. I uh, referred to 120,000 Northern Ireland households uh, in tax credits and the losses again of £900 per annum. The effect on children he mentioned again particularly. 101,000 children already in poverty. The SDLP sceptical of the national living wage and what it will actually mean. <clears throat> Stuart Dixon then took the floor. And he made the point that tax credits are inefficient and are really a return of tax already paid, uh, but they were nevertheless important at this time. He referred to the shiny new live, national living wage, which was, he saw as a rebranded minimum wage, and again referred to this time 200,000 children into poverty. The Tories are out of touch with reality on the ground. Tories will not cave in on welfare. Uh, Mrs Kelly then referred to families with children will be hardest hit referred to the north-south split across in Great Britain and Tory uh, opposition to the welfare reforms. She also referred to the legal action and anti-poverty strategy here against uh, the main parties. Mr McRae, bringing up the rear, uh, referred to tax credits uh, that have a deep impact on the lower-paid working people here and the likelihood of civil unrest 
if this continues the way it is. Tories were pleased at the way the economy has picked up, but this is not the case. Uh, and we appear to have ignored tax credits on the bigger scene. I can uh, tell Mr. McRae that they were touched on in the talks this morning. So, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speakers have to say, Mr. Alec Maskey, to conclude and wind. Um, I first of all, thank all the members for uh, participating in the debate this afternoon. As, as a member of Basil McRae did point out, he and I think all the parties would recognise that this is a very important issue uh, and one that does require a fairly uh, significant debate. And I would like to thank the research department for also and the information service for providing the paperwork and the research pack on that for members' benefit. I think it is worth reading and, and considering over the time ahead. I mean, obviously, this afternoon just gives the parties an opportunity to express their views on this issue and, I suppose, highlight what most parties, what fact everybody who has said spoken here today has highlighted as a, as a major problem that we all have to face. We have no hesitation in accepting the amendment tabled by the Ulster Unionist Party. And in fact, I think that um, it's actually interesting that uh, you know the member Roy Beggs spent a fair bit of his contribution criticising my own party, uh, and that was followed up by Leslie Cree, who also decried the fact that the original motion noted and you know acknowledged and so on and so forth, but didn't actually make any specific recommendation to be do A, B or C. That was quite deliberate in our behalf because we just simply wanted to hear the issue and to get maximum consensus around the chamber. But I would have to say, you know, in fairness, and I would say this respectfully to uh, the also Unionist Party colleagues, that I mean, their amendment doesn't exactly represent the clarion call to mobilise the masses. It actually basically asks the British government to try to be uh, kinder to people who uh, may fall foul of their tax credit changes and other tax measures, but nevertheless, it is recognised and respected by our party as a, a genuine attempt on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party to add to the, the motion. And we are very, very pleased to accept that amendment and share with the members of the Ulster Unionist Party their concerns about the impact that the tax credit changes will actually bring uh, to bear on many, many people who will be very. Uh, even more vulnerable uh, following the introduction of these tax credits. And I would actually go further to say to Mr. Beggs actually that most of what he did say would actually vindicate the Sinn Féin position on uh, trying to challenge and face down some of the, uh, the, the welfare cuts that have been proposed by London. And indeed, if the member would, 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 would acknowledge that as late as today at the talks, our party made it very clear that in terms of dealing with welfare issues and financial matters, uh, the budgetary and all the rest. We, we specifically highlighted the changed environment since this last general election with the election of a Tory government, which are now introducing a whole range of other cuts, including uh, the attacks on the tax credit system, which everybody around the table, around the chamber today, has acknowledged will have a negative impact on people that we all represent out in the various uh, constituencies. So, I would thank the members for their contributions, and while we always may disagree on some nuance or some minor detail, nothing has been said by any member in the chamber today from all of the parties uh, which has uh, taken away from the intention behind this motion, which is to highlight this uh, really a, what really is can only be described as an attack on the underemployed and the underpaid people who, for the most part, are trying to rear a family, trying to go to work, trying to uh, make ends meet. And by all of the figures presented, and there are a number of them, I mean, if you take the Fis Institute of Fiscal Studies, they actually talk about, you know, even if you take in the round with the uh, introduction of what they call the living wage, that about a third of that will actually go back directly to the British government in and, and, and lieu of uh, additional tax revenue raising, but also then they're lim more limited. Uh, obligations on welfare benefits and tax credits themselves. So right away you can see that this attempt by the British government to say we're taking this off, but here we're looking after you, we're giving this other money. On the other hand, it actually is still works out less. So the Conservative figures would tell you, um, and I don't mean the Conservative Party, Conservative figures would tell you that you could be families could be losing anywhere from five hundred and fifty pounds to nine hundred plus uh, a year after that. So uh, again no matter what we look at it, people who are on low pay people who are on low income, people who are working on a small number of hours, limited number of hours, uh, will all suffer as a consequence of these latest uh, announcements by the British government. And all our party would simply say is this, and yes, 
people who go to Westminster can go to Westminster. We don't not bother. Somebody said earlier on we don't bother to go. We actually bother a lot to get a mandate which actually mandates us not to go to Westminster. That doesn't mean to say by any stretch of anybody's imagination that we don't work uh, and lobby and fight very hard for those people who will be uh, adversely affected by British government legislation. And I don't think we've been found wanting on that in any respect of legislation. So our voice has been heard and will continue to be heard, and the people that we represent will be effectively uh, represented. And I wish well anyone who goes to Westminster wants to challenge the British government, they're entitled to do that. That's their mandate, and good luck with it. But what I would say is this is that today, and in the short time ahead, all the parties in this assembly have our own opportunity to do something about the tax credit uh, cuts that have been imposed on people out there. So, whatever about uh, how we agree or disagree with what our attitudes are to welfare, I mean, I heard Stuart Dixon earlier on talking about the welfare reform misery. So, that again is another acknowledgement that what's coming down the line to people uh, on welfare cuts is not a, a happy prospect. So what we all have to do is to work and do our best to mitigate against that, which is what has been the row over this issue for the last number of years, which was very central part of the Stormont House Agreement talks. That still needs to be on the table in these current round of talks, and it will be. So what we all still have a responsibility to tackle that problem, which was made worse by the Tory government in their last number of announcements in terms of their budget and their, their projections for the time ahead. So we have a direct responsibility and an opportunity in the upcoming talks to tackle to the best of our ability the issue of the cuts to welfare, which the British government are trying to impose on the most vulnerable in our societies, and also the cuts to the tax credit system. So, therefore, let us vow ourselves to do what we can. We may disagree what we can do, the extent of what we can do it, but one thing we can do. We can unite in our opposition to these tax credit cuts. We can unite in our opposition to the British government's continuing and ongoing assault on the welfare system and their attacks on the public services, because don't forget that our black grant is going to be reduced by about one and a half billion over the next four or five years. That is something that we can't escape from. I think as Member Baz McCray said, people out there will be looking to us to see what we can do to mitigate against the worst excesses of Tory rule from London, and that's what we have responsibility to do. And as I said earlier on, uh, no later than today, my own party made it very clear that a big focus for us in the upcoming talks around the financial side of things in terms of the negotiations will be around tackling the welfare cuts. Yes, it will be about trying to do what we can uh, around the whole issue of tax credit cuts. And that's what I'm inviting all of the other parties to join with us in doing. In the discussions, will he and his party be presenting achievable objectives, because I understand it's one of the difficulties to date. Well, all I would say in regard to that is that we, we had significant progress made during the Stormont House talks, and whatever about how the wheels fell off the wagon after that, we are very satisfied that there were very clear and specific proposals on the table and agreed by the parties. What, we're what we said today, and the member will be aware because he was at the meeting, we made it very clear that the landscape has changed since the last election. We will certainly get round the table and try to hammer out the best that we can all do uh, to defend the most vulnerable in our society. But I would invite the member back, and I would have to say, and I say this respectfully because the member did take a few minutes of his time early on to criticise my party for not having. Uh, as he says, this particular specific plan or proposals. We had proposals, we had specifics, and we dealt with them in the Stormont House talks. What I would invite the member to do is to also bring forward their, your own members, your own party's views, because your own party in your this afternoon's contribution talk about the problems around the tax credit cuts and welfare. So let's hear if you have any ideas. You cannot simply rely on uh, at criticising Sinn Féin for not having a plan. If you disagree with the welfare cuts, if you disagree with the taxation, tax credit cuts, then you also have a responsibility to bring your proposals to the table. And in our bilaterals, in our bilateral discussions, in our bilateral discussions with your party, we have raised that with you. We have asked you to produce your own goods, and we haven't heard anything yet. But the talks will commence, hopefully, in a much more intensive way in the next week or two. And you'll have all the opportunity to put your proposals on the table. I will give away the number. Briefly to the member, I actually do pay uh, tribute. I think it is a good motion that Sinn Féin have brought that you've raised the issue. And the stark reality is a thousand pounds out of anybody's wage is a significant factor. I mean, even here, 
you lose a thousand pounds, you have a problem, and we need to fix it. No, I. I, I appreciate that contribution from the member, and again, it just underscores the importance of bringing such a motion today. We are more than happy to accept the amendment. I do take encouragement from all of the contributions from all the speakers today. They recognise that the burdens that these tax credit cuts will impose on families who are working hard to put a loaf on their family's table. Thank you. Thank you. The question is, that the amendment standing on the marshal list be made? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it.